rate hikes generally always end up breaking things because the reverse of that is when money is cheap, rates are low, uh, it encourages a lot of borrowing, encourages a lot of uh, excess, whether that's in valuations, whether that's in SPAC funding or whatever. Uh, and then when you see the cost of capital go up, there's, there's always a reset uh, from that bull market and that's currently what we're seeing. Hi, I'm Kaiser Johnson, and this is the Liberty and Finance and Miles Franklin Special of the Week for August 30th through September 5th. Currently, we have silver one ounce Krugerrand, Britannia, Philharmonics for only $4.75 over spot. Sovereign coins from some of the most respected mints in the world. The South African Mint and Rand Refinery, the Royal Mint in London, the Austrian Mint. The Krugerrand of Britannia and Philharmonics are all 395, or 99.9% .9 pure silver, they are all approved for your precious metals IRA, and while there's no minimum order, the Philharmonics come in tubes of 20 coins, while the Britannia, Krugerrand come in tubes of 25, and all of them come in monster boxes of 500 coins. We look forward to helping you secure your future and implement your precious metal strategy by locking an order of 2022 silver Krugerrand, Britannia, or Philharmonics, all at only 475 over spot while supplies last. Call us today, tonight, or even after hours and weekends at 1-888-81-LIBERTY. It's 1-888-815-4237. Hey everyone, this is Elijah K. Johnson with Liberty and Finance. And back with us today is Peter Bookfar, the Chief Investment Officer of the Bleakley Financial Group and also editor of the Book Report. Peter, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Well, it's great to have you. And I wanted to discuss kind of where we are in the economy right now. We are seeing uh, a bit of a sell-off again in the markets the last week or so since Jerome Powell s spoke. And also we're seeing a downturn in the precious metals. Um, but you've recently stated that there's really three stages to a bear market. Can you expand on that? And where are we right now? Well, historically speaking, the, the first phase is uh, a, a multiple rethink. Uh, where excessive multiples that get created in a bull market reset. And I think a, a lot of that uh, took place beginning at the euphoric peak in February 2021, uh, well into 2022. The second phase is uh, the economic consequences of a slowdown uh, with to earnings. And I think we're just on the cusp of that. Uh, with the slowdown being obviously global and in response to higher inflation, even though it's moderating, and certainly in response to the sharp rise in interest rates. And usually the third phase is uh, everyone just throws in the towel in disgust and says, I'll never buy a stock again. That's usually the bottom of the bear market. So can you share with our viewers a bit more about, I guess, where we are right now? Because it definitely doesn't seem like we're at that last stage. However, there is more pessimism now than there was probably a couple weeks ago. Yeah, I believe that we're really just beginning the second phase where it's dawning on people that uh, global growth is slowing, profit margins have peaked, and earnings are going to be reset lower. Uh, and, I, and I think that's the next challenge here uh, for markets. I know that people are just really going to be making buy and sell decisions based on when the Fed's going to stop raising interest rates. But um, I, I think people have to think more deeper than that. Number one, because just because they stop raising interest rates, uh, they're still doing quantitative tightening and we still have um, an economic slowdown to digest. And as for inflation, we did see a little bit of a pause, at least if you look at the official numbers in July. What is your outlook for inflation and how the Fed is going to react? Because I know a lot of people are expecting possibly only a 50 basis points rate hike next next month. Well, we've, we've of course, seen a, a sharp decline in commodity prices. Uh, on the good side, there, there are plenty of, of examples of price pressures that are easing. On the services side, price pressures are going to be more persistent. But I think on a rate of change basis, inflation is going to continue to slow. Uh, the question is, is how fast and uh, to what extent does it slow? I still think we're gonna have to deal with persistent and sticky inflation for the years to come, even though it's gonna be well below uh, the peak rates that we've seen like eight, nine percent. And that's in the US, of course, uh, the rest of the world is dealing with much higher inflation because of energy, particularly the UK, that um, could see inflation peak at 15 to 20% uh, 
uh, the eurozone is going to see inflation probably go above 10. Um, so, but in the U.S., the inflation story is getting better again on a rate of change basis, and what I just mentioned. But I still think it's going to remain well above the one to two percent level that uh, uh, we've become so used to pre-COVID. And you've also mentioned how the Fed has to be very careful because you know things could reach a breaking point if they raise rates uh, too fast. Can you expand on that? Well, too fast, but also just rate hikes generally uh, always end up breaking things because the reverse of that is when money is cheap, rates are low, uh, it encourages a lot of borrowing, encourages a lot of uh, excess, whether that's in valuations, whether that's in SPAC funding or whatever. Uh, and then when you see the cost of capital go up, there's, there's always a reset uh, uh, from that bull market. And that's currently what we're seeing. Uh, we're a very, uh, well, I should say cheap money has been the lifeblood uh, of both economic activity and, and, and market behavior for years. And uh, when, when money becomes more dear, uh, you have uh, obvious uh, implications to uh, both the economy and stocks and bonds and everything else uh, in reverse. It does seem like we have had cheap money for quite a while now and, you know, that that's being taken away and we're seeing uh, that those effects definitely in the markets right now and the economy. What is your take on how this is going to impact the average person um, and how it's impacting the average person right now? Well, inflation is the biggest thing that's impacting the average person right now uh, that's running well above uh, wage growth. And if you're a senior citizen, it's running even further above uh, wage growth if you're living just on fixed income. So that's the biggest thing that's affecting people right now. Uh, now, the rising cost of capital uh, is obviously going to affect uh, those that want to buy a house. We've seen a, a pretty short deceleration in the pace of home price transactions. We're finally seeing a softening in home price gains. Uh, we're also seeing the, 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 the higher cost of funding impact auto sales. And just the, the general reset of valuations and, and, uh, and, and market behavior. I mean, if you're a private equity firm that relied on cheap funding, you're, you may be uh, needing to come up with more equity. Uh, we have venture capital money uh, that's getting um, sort of a, a double and triple check before that money gets deployed. So, uh, again, a higher cost of capital creates a, a, a rethink in a lot of different areas of the economy that has been medicated for many years on artificially low interest rates. Now, obviously, last time we had this uh, was in the 70s, and, and Paul Volcker had to raise rates to you know astronomical levels, rates that probably people can't even imagine today. Um, it sounds like what you're saying is this inflation that is the biggest impact on the average person um, is here to stay, at least pretty high inflation. Um, so why at this point doesn't the Fed just why doesn't Powell pull a Volcker and just, you know, raise rates to 19 percent? What is stopping the Fed and why is the Fed really trapped in this situation? Well, when you have uh, a, a national debt to GDP ratio, that's about 100 percent. When you have total business debt as percent to GDP. Uh, at about record highs, uh, you are uh, susceptible to uh, dangerous things if you raise interest rates uh, too high. Uh, so th that, that's the reason. We, in the 1970s, the debt to GDP ratio in the US was about 30%. Um, and if you look at total debt to GDP in the entire economy, you know, you're talking something that's like north of 300%. So that's why uh, it's sort of this dangerous game between on one hand, wanting to tamp down on inflation, which I give them credit for, to respond to their own mistakes, of course, um, but at the same time, waiting for a, uh, a debt-dependent, uh, cheap money-dependent economy uh, to deal with, with, with the changed rate environment. It seems like then for people invested in the general equities market, then it's... Uh two bad things are happening, right? The, the prices the, of their stocks are, are falling, uh, but then also the, the, the dollars in which they're valued are also being devalued at a, at, a, at a great rate. So I guess, what do you say to people who are invested in the general equities at the moment? Well, if you're invested in U.S. equities, the dollar has been rallying, so you have really haven't been negatively impacted there. But the, 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 the two issues with, with uh, U.S. stocks right now is you have this, this multiple compression that, as I mentioned in the beginning, uh, has been the first stage of this bear market, but I still think has more um, compression to go. And then on the other hand, the other part that really drives stocks is also earnings. And I think that's under threat 
not just from a top line perspective, particularly if inflation starts to slow, because inflation has really been the only thing that has been driving revenue growth as opposed to volume growth, and uh, also profit margin degradation, which I think is going to accelerate in the quarters to come. So that combination of lower multiples and potentially lower earnings you know, creates a more challenging investing environment. And when it comes to where you're finding value at the moment, I think it's it's very difficult for the for the investor to find value at the moment. Um, what are some strategies that you're really looking at right now? Like you said, it is very difficult. Uh, it's very challenging because in, in this kind of environment, sometimes cheap gets cheaper, and certainly the expensive stuff gets gets after its multiple trimming that we've seen so far uh, can can overdo it to the downside, just like it does on the upside. Uh, I still like energy stocks. I still think that they're very cheap with uh, some U.S. names trading at four or five times earnings. Also, European energy stocks that are very, very cheap. Uh, we also like um, precious metals and other value stocks in the U.S. that have single-digit P ratios and good dividends. I think dividends are going to be, in the next 10 years, a key contributor to total return, uh, as opposed to the last 10 years that it was mostly capital gains. So. Uh, we're looking for uh, good companies that have high returns on equity and pay a good dividend that trades at multiples that I think are reasonable. And um, in a bear market, you get opportunities like that. I mean, bear markets are tough to live through, but at the same time, they also create a lot of opportunities. And looking out over a multi-year time frame, uh, still pretty bullish on, uh, on markets in Asia, uh, believing that that's where GDP growth of substance is going to take place in the coming decade. And uh, valuations are pretty reasonable. And, and those markets have dramatically underperformed the U.S. over the past 10 years. And you mentioned precious metals. It seems like that's definitely the go-to when it comes to, like, uh, a lot of people think of them as inflation hedges, kind of hard assets to own. But often when we do see a downturn in the general equities market, you know, there's margin calls and people want to sell everything. And that's what we've seen, a downturn also in the precious metal markets. Um, your perspective on that, you mentioned precious metals as a place to be, but it seems like at least right now what we're seeing is uh, gold and silver falling. Silver dipped below $18. Uh, today we're recording this on Thursday. So your perspective on the action we've seen there. Well, it's definitely not been the place to be over the last couple of years, for sure. Uh, gold, by the way, is, is only down about 5% this year. So relative to stocks, it's doing much better. Silver is doing much worse because it's a leverage play on that. Uh, so it hasn't been the inflation hedge that it's, it's sort of sold as. But I think a lot of that has to do with the belief that the Fed is going to uh, take care of inflation via aggressive rate hikes. And that's why we've seen a very aggressive move higher in the dollar. And uh, also worries about, well, not worries, I think reality that we're in a recession or at least on the cusp of one and um, you know what that means for uh, lowering inflation. But people have to understand that, that real interest rates, so inflation adjusted interest rates, are still deeply negative. And I still think that that is a, a support to uh, gold and silver. I think the dollar rally has really been only interest rate differentials. And if you believe, as I, as I do, that a recession is basically here and it's going to limit rate hikes from here after the Fed will probably hike in September uh, and maybe one time after that, uh, that once the end of the hikes become a reality, uh, they're, they're, then to me, um, the dollar rallies over and um, gold and silver will find their, their day. But I think that that really helps to explain why they've traded so poorly is, is just this belief in the Fed uh, that, that um, they're, they're going to be they're on the case, uh, so to speak. And can you remind our viewers then the reasons that you believe that they're not or that inflation is going to stay pretty, it's going to stay high for a while? Well, we're going to go into a recession. And part of that is inflation is going to continue to recede. But I still think it's going to be below, I'm sorry, above the rate of interest rates. And that when push comes to shove, the Fed is going to have weak knees during a weak economy. And that once the unemployment rate starts to pick up, and go north of 4%, uh, you can be sure that the Fed is going to, uh, uh, I think, back off from their aggressive stance. Uh, at the same time, again, I think inflation is going to be remaining persistent and, and well above the 1% to 2% that we've been so accustomed to for so many years. And as part of that, the dollar, which, I, like I said, had my belief has been interest rate differentials has been its only support. 
that it's going to lose that that bull case. I mean, we, we have other central banks that are getting, getting more aggressive. It's not just the Fed. The ECB meets next week, and there's talk now that they're going to hike 75 basis points. The Bank of England is going to be raising again 50 soon, and also outright selling bonds as part of their QT program. Uh, we saw 100 basis point increase in the Bank of Canada. So it's not just the Fed anymore that's being aggressive with this, these interest rate hikes. So I think this dollar rally, uh, well, I don't know where it goes in the downside. I think it's just getting very stretched to the upside. And it sounds like so when, when the market finally realizes that the Fed cannot control inflation or that inflation is going to continue relatively high for a while, that's when metals will make their move. Do you have a preference right now, seeing where gold and silver both are uh, between the two metals? I, I like them both. I mean, silver is just a leverage play on gold. So if you're bullish on gold, you're probably going to be very bullish on silver. So uh, we own them both in, in addition to miners. So um, uh, I'm comfortable with both. But again, if you're going to buy silver, you got to have just the stomach for the volatility relative to gold. It definitely seemed like, it seems like, as you mentioned, it has been a lot more volatile. But, but, but silver um, does have very interesting uh, industrial applications. Half of the demand for silver is industrial. And you know you want solar panels and you want EVs and you want wind turbines. Uh, it takes silver in order to produce that. I think that's a very interesting aspect to silver because it's seen as kind of like a safe haven like gold, but then also it has industrial um, industrial uh, so, so much industrial use as well. So I think is that possibly why it's been falling a bit more because we're entering a recession right now? It, it could be one of the reasons. I mean, some days it trades like copper and other days it trades like gold as a monetary metal. Uh, it, it definitely goes back and forth. I think over time it's going to trade more uh, with gold, but uh, yeah, it definitely could be one of the factors for its uh, outsized weakness relative to gold. All right, and Peter, if people are interested in uh, finding you online, where they where can they go to learn more? Well, they can follow me on Twitter at pbookbar. Uh, they can read my daily macro, economic, and market missives at the Book Report. Uh, it, the website's bookreport.com, B-O-O-C-K report.com. And I'm the CIO of a wealth management firm called Weekly. And uh, they can see our website at weekly.com if they have any interest. All right. Thank you so much, Peter, for joining us today. Last thoughts for our viewers. What are the things that people should definitely be, uh, who are invested in the markets, should definitely be looking at right now? Well, every, everything we, we really touched upon. Uh, it's going to be the direction of inflation and economic activity from here, which both I feel are decelerating. And we'll see to what extent, uh, how much the Fed likely overdoes it, overdoes it with the rate hikes. And also understand in the background, uh, quantitative tightening matters a lot for markets. And uh, I, I think that's going to um, be a major factor and challenge and headwind uh, for the equity markets. On the flip side, uh, a bear market, both in stocks and bonds, are providing opportunities. I and mean, look at fixed income. We finally have interest rates. You can buy a two-year treasury and get 3.5%. Uh, that was unheard of a couple of years ago. So those with liquidity, those with cash, uh, should not be shy about taking advantage of the opportunities that, that tough markets provide. All right, Peter, once again, thank you so much for your time and God bless. Thank you. Miles Franklin Precious Metals is one of America's oldest and most trusted bullion dealers. Miles Franklin is A-plus rated and accredited by the Better Business Bureau, licensed and bonded, and has zero complaints ever registered. Here at Liberty and Finance, we are licensed brokers with Miles Franklin. To order, simply call us, discuss your needs, and we will let you know our live inventory, prices, and availability, and lock in your order over the phone. Once your order is locked, the price is held for you regardless of market fluctuations, and the metals are reserved for you awaiting your settled payment. Within one business day of ordering, you will receive an email invoice detailing the order and payment instructions. Miles Franklin accepts payments by bank wire, ACH or electronic check, money order, check mailed priority mail, and cryptocurrency. The fastest forms of payment are bank wire and cryptocurrency. Upon settled payment, metals will ship out within three to five business days. You will receive tracking information via email. Domestic shipping charges are $15 for any order under 500 ounces of silver or 10 ounces of gold. For orders larger than that, domestic shipping is free. The package will be double boxed, fully insured, and labeled discreetly 
with no indication of the contents inside. For your privacy, the name Miles Franklin will not even be on the package. To talk to myself, Elijah, my brother Kaiser, or my father Dunnigan, call 1-888-81-LIBERTY. That's 1-888-815-4237.